Since European settlement, we see recurrent images of droughts, the consequences of droughts and floods on land. These are just some images uh, on the left for drought, where we normally see dead carcasses. The most recent one, 2014, was west of Townsville. On the right, we have flood events. And you often see men congregating towards the pubs after flood events. I'm not sure why they do that, but it seems to be a common phenomenon. And the bottom picture is Brisbane in 2011. The top left picture, 1902, was the culmination of what they call the Federation drought. And they actually tried to pray for rain in April. Now, that's in the dry season, but they did get some rain in December of that year, which broke the drought. What I want to look at is all that water has to go somewhere. It goes out onto the reef. We've heard a bit about some of the consequences of that for the reef. But I also want to explain to you how the records of these flood events can actually inform what's been going on in the land and look at longer term changes in how our climate is varying. The top picture there is the Burdekin River in winter. This can be the, the biggest river in Australia, but it's highly seasonal. I also had a lot of time to take that picture as my husband insisted on driving into the sand just to prove how dry it was there. And he'd seen other people with four-wheel drives doing it. We didn't have a four-wheel drive, so. <laughs> <laughs> the picture below that, the, summer, the following summer, that bridge has totally disappeared under that water. In the middle, you can be out in a paddock somewhere. You can't even see the Burdekin River, but you come across a sign like this. This is commemorating the 1946 flood, which if you remember from the previous slide, we saw flooding in Townsville. On the right-hand side, we can see how we can look at what happens to these flood plumes as they go out onto the reef and they extend across the reef. Malcolm has mentioned coral cores. There are certain massive corals which contain uh, growth bands, but they also contain a variety of other information about what has gone on in the past on the reef. What I'm going to talk to you tonight about is luminescent lines. Now, things can get a bit wild on the dance floor when people put on the ultraviolet light, but when you put certain inshore coral slices from those under the same disco light, you see these wonderful lines mirroring the outside surface of the colony, as you see in that bot central bottom picture. These we call luminescent lines. They record the occurrence and intensity of freshwater flood events. On the right-hand side, we see the 1973-74 flood events. There might be some of you who remember this was another big flood year for Brisbane and parts of northeastern Queensland. These are from corals 800 km kilometers apart, Cairns, Townsville, off Rockhampton, and they all show that really intense flood line associated with that 1974 flood event. Now, we can take information from a lot of corals. These are sources of what we call proxy climate information. One of the important things is, it's like somebody telling you a story about an incident they've seen. You might not believe one person, but if several people all tell the same story, if several corals all tell you the same story, then we have confidence in reconstructing the past before we have instrumental observations. In the graph that we have here on the top, I've actually reconstructed the Burdekin River flow back into the past, back to the 1630s. What I've done here is just calculated the number of extremes that occurred each decade up through the 2001 to 2010 decade. Blue indicates wet extremes, orange indicates dry extremes. In the 1890s and the 1970s experienced the most number of wet extremes. The most recent decade, however, experienced the greatest number of both wet and dry extremes. What these corals seem to be telling us is that the frequency of extremes is increasing. And also, not ex obviously visible in this graph, is that the wet years seem to be getting wetter and the dry years getting drier. 
Now, one of the reasons the wet years are getting wetter is because the tropical oceans are warming. So before we went into that 2011, 2010-11 wet season, the water temperatures around northern Australia were at a record high. These helped to fuel an active monsoon during a La Nina event. They po probably partially helped the power of tropical cyclone Yasi to develop. We are changing this environment. We can also look back at these corals because they can be well preserved after death. In the top left, we see the marina development at Nelly Bay, Magnetic Island off Townsville. You wouldn't actually think this was a site for scientific investigation, but when they were dredging for this new marina, they found a large number of these massive parietes corals, these big corals, underneath the seafloor. And we managed to persuade the local 10-4 support battalion as a field exercise to collect them for us and bring them back to Ames, which they had great fun doing. These corals have subsequently been carbon, radiocarbon dated down to 6,000 years ago. And so here are two of these corals, and they're just big lumps of calcium carbonate. But we can take slices, we can look at the luminescent lines the way we do in the modern corals. And what's exciting about these two corals, which were randomly picked up from the seafloor, is we can actually match up the luminescent lines between these two corals. Now, to me as a scientist, that is really cool. We can match the same years in these two corals 6,000 years ago. And then actually tell you that the coral at the top there, NEL07C, died 44 years after the one below it. What we can also do is look at how we could reconstruct the Burdekin River flow at this point 6,000 years ago. And what it tells these corals tell us was that the Burdekin flow and hence the monsoon rainfall was probably about half of, it, half of what it was today. Now you might say, well, that's all very nice and very fun. Why are we interested in this period in the past. One of the ways we look to project to what's happening in the future, what will con continue to happen with continued global warming, is scientists use complex climatic models. We don't fully understand the climate system, so we have to keep on improving those models. One way we can do that is look, see how they operate for periods in the past when 6,000 years ago, the Earth's position relative to the sun was a bit different. There was more energy going into the northern hemisphere summer, and you would expect northern hemisphere monsoon climates to be a bit stronger and those of the southern hemisphere to be a bit weaker. What these corals are telling us from northeastern Queensland is we do seem to see a less effective monsoon in the summer season at that part of the world. So these corals are telling us lots of stories about what's happened in the past. We know rainfall 6,000 years ago was about half that of today. Also that 2011 was probably about the third wettest year going back 375 years, back to 1639. And we're also telling us that we are seeing more frequent rainfall regimes. So this wonderful picture of a train crossing the flooded Burdekin River. I'm not sure which carriage I would have liked to have been in, but <laughs> whether you, you can see yourself flooding as you're going. But all that water that that train is crossing is leaving its records in the corals you see to the right. Thank you. <laughs>